Stand with us tonight. It's good to see all of you back on this for this evening service, and we thank you so much for coming and being here tonight. I hope you come expecting. I know the Lord has got something for you tonight. If you'll receive from Him, and we're just going to let God have His way. Amen. Will you bow your head and let's go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we love you and we thank you, God, for your grace and for your mercy and love and for the opportunity to be able to be here in your house and to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would save the lost, heal the sick, and set the captive free tonight. Have your way and do your work, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen.
Come on, sing it one more time. How great is our God. Has he been good to you tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you tonight. You're worthy of our praise tonight. Hallelujah. How great. We sing how great. He's the name above all names. Come on. Come on, lift your voice. Hallelujah. He's the name above all names. There's still power in the name of Jesus. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Lord, we lift you up tonight. Ah, we'll see. How great is our God. He's the name above all names. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus tonight. Name above all names. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight. He is worthy. How great is our God. How great. Come on, sing it from your heart tonight. He's sure been good to me. Oh God, sing to me. Hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. In all. How great. Come on, let's keep it going just like that. How great is our God. How great. Hallelujah. Is our God. He's worthy tonight. Sing with me. How great. Is our God. And all great. How great. In the name above all names. He's the name above all names. Come on, sing it like you mean it tonight. Hallelujah. He's the name above all names. There's still power in the name of Jesus. Worthy of all names. Hallelujah. My heart will sing. How great. God, you've been good to us. The name above all names. We gotta do it again. Hallelujah. Hold up. Hallelujah. Oh, we'll see how great is our God. Come on, just worship wherever you want. Hallelujah. Now he's the name above all names. Hallelujah. He is worthy of all praise. And my heart 
you sing. Hallelujah. How great is our God. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Hallelujah. I just want to keep the worship going, but I'm going to go ahead and move tonight. If you need a touch in your body or you've got a need and you just want folks to gather around you and, and take that need to the Lord, the presence of the Lord is here tonight. He's here tonight. All things are possible when Jesus is in the house. Amen. If you need something, if you've got a special need, we want you to come. We're going to gather around you and we're going to ask the Lord to touch you and to meet that need. Praise and worship team, just keep doing what you do. Just lead us in worship. Hallelujah. 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 Doesn't matter what it is, God's able tonight. Hallelujah. Church family, would you come and gather around them? We need your help. We need you to come and let's pray. Be led of the Lord tonight and pray for somebody tonight. Hallelujah.
worship him a moment. Hallelujah. Let's sing. Come on, lift him up tonight. There's still a good anointing here this evening. Yes, they bow before your throne. Hallelujah. Come on, think about it. The angels. All the elders. You are, Lord. You and you alone are worthy of it all, God. Worthy of it all. Hallelujah. We glorify you tonight, God. All things were by you, God. All things. Come on, faith worship center, lift your voice tonight. Hallelujah. Worthy of it all. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, you are worthy of it all. Hallelujah. For from you are all things. To you are all things. Lord, from you are all things. And to you are all things. Lord, from you are all things. Serve the glory. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your presence tonight, Lord, and for the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit. God, your presence has been so real already tonight, God, and we just thank you for it. God, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you would move upon every heart to meet every need that's been represented here tonight. 
I can't believe that you showed up just for no reason, Lord, but I believe that you showed up to do something in somebody's heart and somebody's life. God, we're grateful. We're humbled, Lord. And we thank you and we ask you, Lord, to do what you've come to do and touch every individual. And we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name. Don't know if I've ever done this, but I want Brother Torrance to come. All the other stuff can wait till later that we've got planned. There's a good anointing here. Our hearts are open, prepared, and, and the worship. And I don't know if he'll dismiss you or not, but I want him to come and take his liberty in the Lord, and we'll catch up in just a little while. Come on, Brother Torrance. Praise the Lord tonight. Come on, somebody praise the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Anybody love Jesus? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's worthy. Amen. There's no greater words or song, in my opinion, that can be sang or written than to tell the Lord how worthy he is. If you, if, you, if you get tired of that, then don't go to heaven. Because it's literally going on right now around the throne of God, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's worthy to be praised. You can give him a hand clap of praise as you take your seat tonight. God bless you, musicians and singers. Uh, just for a few moments, uh, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews. I, I just want to honor all of you, the singers, musicians, pastors, the Alexander family. Uh, thank you for uh, having us to be here and to share and preach tonight. And more than anything, just the fellowship and worship together. Uh, I got to be with them a little bit on Friday night in, uh, where was I? Y'all, I forget where I met sometime. I just put it in the GPS and go. I think it's Searcy, Arkansas, right? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, we had a chance to fellowship, and, uh, and so it's good to, I didn't know I was this close to Portia, so we're here and, uh, to fellowship and worship, and I just honor all of you and all of uh, the families who are here tonight, and uh, again, the Alexander family, Brother Steve and Brian and your wives, the friendships that we have, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. And your mom and dad, you, sister, thank you. And some of y'all don't know what that thank you is for, but every time I come here, I get a pecan pie. And I don't know if I've eaten a better one, man. I mean, it's, and I literally, and I may be ashamed to tell you this, but uh, I don't cut it. I don't slice it. I just eat it while I'm driving up the highway with a fork. I start in the middle, and I just work my way around the edges, man. And uh, is that <laughs> I know the sons know. <laughs> but uh, but I, I just, uh, just appreciate Hebrews chapter 4, a very familiar passage. I promise you I won't be before you long. Uh, I'll share what God has laid on my heart. Uh, I believe a reminder to us of who Christ is, uh, what Christ has done for us, and uh, that we should hold on to it. Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll jump into it tonight in verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. He says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who is passed into the heavens. Notice those words. Jesus, the son of God. We have a high priest. He's passed into the heavens and then the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, but many believe other things. Uh, Jesus, the Son of God, it tells us who this high priest is. And then in light of who he is and what he's done, he tells us, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And I'll just a few moments use the subject, Jesus, our great high priest. Jesus, our great high priest. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you tonight. Lord, we thank you for the service that is so powerful and the, your presence has been so pronounced in this place tonight. Father, we just ask you to help us. 
We ask you to anoint us, strengthen us, Lord, that no violence will be done to your word or to your spirit or to your people. And Lord, we ask that you would anoint the people as well to hear what I believe you've given for the service. And we give you all the glory and praise and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. A description is given, if you read the book of Hebrews, uh, obviously the audience that the writer is writing to are the Jewish people. And there is an encouragement uh, for the Jews, if you read chapter 6, uh, I'm going to say Paul, so I know, you know there's a lot of debate uh, who wrote Hebrews, but I'm preaching tonight, so I get, I get to say Paul, right? <laughs> I know some people believe Apollos and some believe, but nonetheless, uh, I believe the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, but that was an encouragement for them to move from the old tradition and the old law and embrace the reality of the law, which is Christ. And that is the reality that we have today. You and I don't have to go back to any systems, rules, or whatever the case. We can embrace our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. And it is a beautiful thing to be free. Amen? Amen. There's nothing quite like freedom. There's nothing. Uh, when you're free, you talk different. When you're free, you act different. When you're free, you carry yourself different. You don't walk. There's a way you carry. It's not arrogance, but there's something about being free. Right. And there's something about your freedom and my freedom that you and I didn't earn it, but it was purchased for us through Christ and what Christ did. Hence, in Galatians, Paul says to stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. He tells us he set us free. He's uh, liberated us from the law, liberated us from sin and self. Tonight, we're saved. That's some theology that uh, the church needs to go back to. I'm saved. I know we can talk about money. We can talk about a whole lot of things. But, man, if you can't rejoice over the fact that you're saved, I, I mean, the cars come and go, houses come and go, but salvation is something that all of us have in common. We had a sin problem, and we had a solution, and his name is Jesus Christ. So Paul writes to them, and that encouragement is there to go on to perfection, to go on to maturity. And, uh, and when we were in chapter 4, I, I, many theologians have uh, coined the book of Hebrews in one word, and that word is better. In other words, Jesus is better. Better. He's better than Abraham. He's better than Moses. He's better than the law and the prophets. He's better than the angels. He's better than Aaron, the high priest, which we'll get to in the text tonight. But Jesus is better. Somebody say Jesus is better. He's better than Abraham. I know Abraham was a great patriarch. He's better than Moses. Moses brought the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, but Jesus delivered the world out of sin. He's better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than Aaron, the priesthood that was on earth that God instituted and ordained to stand as a type of Christ. Now, just to go here for just a few moments, it's beautiful, I believe, when you read the Old Testament and correlate it to the new covenant and understand the, uh, the, pr the principles and how we have a better covenant. Even the Bible says that based on better promises. Uh, you and I can access the Father. We don't need to go through the priest. We can go through our great high priest, Jesus Christ, and we can go directly before the throne of God. You don't have to call my house to get into the presence of God. You can wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and call on Jesus. You can wake up at 5 in the morning and call on Jesus because you're in covenant relationship with him based on Jesus Christ. But just for a few moments, let's look at the Old Testament. Uh, you go back to the book of Exodus and what God has instituted the law. God has instituted and given the Ten Commandments. He's given the laws. He's given uh, the responsibilities of the priests. God even told them how to build the tabernacle. He told them what material to use. He told them from down to the very pins. He said, this is how you do it. This is what you cover it with. He told them either this is covered with gold, this is silver, this is purple, this is blue. I mean, God gave everything. Thing. And everything that God gave was a type in some way of the person and work of Christ. 
Now, when you look at the Exodus, starting around verse chapter 25, God begins to tell them to bring materials for the tabernacle. I'm telling you this for a reason. And when he brought these materials, they were to build, if you will, a tent. And in this tent where God would actually reside with the people. Now, I find that amazing because he told them, he said, I want you to build an altar. I want you to build a, a table of showbread. I want you to build a lampstand. I want you to be, put curtains on it. He says, I want you to bring this sort of material uh, because Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. I mean, everything pointed to Jesus. And it's amazing because as you keep reading through Exodus, he says, build an altar. Now, when you came to this place, you came into the gate and you were at the outer court. And when you got into the outer court, you would find the altar. The altar was where the animals were actually sacrificed. This is stuff you've heard. This is stuff you know. But is it okay for me to remind you tonight? And you come to the altar. And when you get to the altar, the altar, of course, was a type of Christ. Uh, the, 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 let me say it better. It's a type of where Christ died. It's a type of the cross. And the animals were to be brought to the altar, but the priesthood were the people who would catch the blood or take the animals, burn them, take the, the, the carcass or burn it or whatever specified in that particular offering, where, whether it was a sin offering, whether it was a, a peace offering, whether it was a meat offering, whether it was a whole burnt offering, whether it was whatever a trespass offering, it all pointed to Christ. And think about this for just a moment. There was work constantly going on every day. Nine o'clock offering, three o'clock offering. Trim the wicks and keep the burning lights. I mean, it was so much. Replenish the oil and just, I mean, it was so much work going on. And I mean, this was a constant thing. And what, what amazes me about the Old Testament was that no matter how many animals they brought, no matter how many offerings they brought, they still had a conscience of knowing that the sin debt really had not yet truly been paid. Daily bringing animals. And it makes you wonder, like, when would be enough? When would be enough? But they had to keep doing it. They had to keep doing it. But then once a year, on the great day of atonement, now you got to remember, Aaron was the first person to be what's called the high priest. The high priest was a mediator. He was the man who stood between man and God. He represented the people before God. It was even on his very vesture, his clothing that he wore. And so on the great day of atonement, Aaron would go in once a year and he would take blood from the altar. Now watch this and go beyond, pass through. Notice the terminology. He would pass through the outer court, pass through the inner court, and he was the only one who could go behind this huge curtain called the veil. And he would go behind the veil once a year, and he would sprinkle the blood from the altar and bring it behind the veil and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. The mercy seat was the covering for the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a type of the throne of God, the presence of God here on earth with the people of God. So now you have a high priest who passed through the tabernacle. Notice our text, Jesus passed through the heavens. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But this would go on every year. People would wait outside and they would wait until Aaron made this sacrifice or this atonement, and they would know that peace had been made, atonement had been made. But here's the reality. He had to leave, come back out, put on his garments, and he would have to do it all over again the next year. I mean, it was a constant work. It was a constant thing. It was a constant conscious of knowing uh, that, you know, that he's going to have to do it again next year. He's going to. And so what is happening in the book of Hebrews is that Paul, there it is again, Paul, he's given a correlation between what the Old Testament was and showing how Christ in his person and work is better than that system. Now, 
Aaron had to go in every year. Remember that now. So our text tonight tells us, he says this. He said, listen, he said, we have a high priest, a great high priest, who is passed into the heavens. Now, uh, Aaron passed through the outer court, the inner court, and behind the veil. Jesus passed into the heavens, and when he went to heaven, he went and did exactly almost what Aaron did and presented something into the mercy seat, which is the throne of God. If you read John chapter 16, the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of righteousness, judgment, and sin. Now, he says this caveat of righteousness because I go to the Father. Oh my God. When Jesus died, he said, I'm going to the Father and I'm going to present something to him. He presented God with a perfect righteousness. Now, whoever names the name of Jesus, they don't have to try to procure their own righteousness, which is filthy rags. They can have a righteousness that has already been done and purchased for them through Christ. And all you have to do is believe. And God says that you are justified. You're righteous. Man, that's good news. Simply because I can't earn this. I can't attain this. So I love when it says Jesus passed into the heavens. Then he says it's the Son of God. This tells us two things. That Jesus Christ was man and he was God. Now that blew the Jews' mind. Because the writer here, Paul, tells the Jews that Jesus is the Son of God. It shows distinction. I, I, for the life of me, and if somebody here tonight, I say this with all due respect to my oneness friends or whoever you may be, but with, for the life of me, I can't see how people don't see distinction between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, I don't see, but because the Bible is clear that there is a distinction here. The Bible is clear. In uh, uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible gives a distinction. How? He says, God sent Jesus. That, that's two different people. Am I right, y'all? I know I got some public school folk in here. He sent Jesus. God is seated on the throne, and he sent Jesus, and he anointed him with the Holy Spirit. When you look at redemption, the Godhead works all through the redemption plan. From the incarnation to the life of Christ. When Jesus is life, 12 years old, he said, wish ye not, I came to do what? The will of the one who sent me, my father. In other words, I am not him, he is in me. He is not me, I am in him. We're two distinct persons, but we have the same plan. That's the Godhead. And then while he was here, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. John 3.36 tells us that he was filled with the Spirit without measure. This is the third member of the Godhead. And I know a lot of people say, well, the Holy Spirit is just goosebumps. My Jehovah's Witness friends told, tell me that he's just a strong force in the earth. I had a man who I worked with, I may have told you before, and I asked him, he said, well, the Holy Spirit is not God. He's not a person. He's a force. I said, well, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, can a force speak? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, the Bible says the Holy Spirit speaks. He said, well, I don't know. I said, no, you got to answer me. Can a force feel? The Bible says in, he, in Ephesians that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Bible says in John that the Holy Spirit speaks. Matter of fact, if you read Acts chapter 5, the Bible, Peter calls the Holy Spirit God. I see three people, I don't know about you, but I see three in the divine Godhead, not 33% each, but three distinct persons. And here, oneness, brothers and sisters, we don't believe in three personalities. We believe in three distinct persons. That the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, but these three are one. How can three be one? In perfect unity. You don't have a problem with accepting the fact that five people can live in a house, but it still be one family. You look at American government, it's got three branches, but it's still one government. We don't have any problem accepting that. But when it comes to accepting not who we said God is, but who God said that he is, for some reason we have an issue accepting it. The Godhead worked through redemption. 
Even when Jesus died, Hebrews 9, 14 says that Jesus offered himself to who? To God. But through the eternal spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I didn't mean to get on that tangent, but hey, it is what it is, man. I'm going to chase some rabbits, so just follow me. So as you study it out, as you read it, as you keep going, you find the Godhead working. You find who Paul says Jesus is. He's the son of God. He tells us in light of all of this, hold on to your profession. You hold on to what you believe. You hold on to what you know, not based on how you feel. Because saints, there's going to be some days where we feel like we, we just don't feel good. I mean, if you, you want to get some bad news, turn, get on social media or turn on the news. It's all kind of bad news. You can't, I mean, the government is jacked up. The, the media is jacked Everybody's just messed up. Amen. So just go ahead and tell it like it is. You can't trust nobody. You don't know who to trust. They're coming to you live and telling you you're watching the president give a speech. And I don't know if y'all have this here, but back home we got this old look we give when we know somebody lying. That's how I look now. When, every, when I see, I'm sorry, y'all just pray for me. Anytime they open their mouth, my fellow Americans, I just start giving them that twisted look inside. Eye, like, here we go. Because I know the next few minutes is about to be some lies, some pandering, and something else. So we live in a world, saints, where you can just fluctuate in your emotions a lot of times. But Paul says, listen, hold fast to your profession. Because you have something that is sure. My God. See, the government is not sure. I don't know what's going to happen next year. I don't know who. I don't know if the thing is fixed. I don't know if they fix it. I don't know none of that. But I tell you what I do know. I know that I know that I've got a high priest who is passed into the heavens. And I'm going to hold on to that. I, my God. Paul said the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, let those who name the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. We've got something we can hold on to. You don't know if your job's going to be there tomorrow. But you know Jesus is going to be there. Hold to that. High priest went in. He came out. He went in. He came out. He went in. Hebrews chapter 7 said Jesus needed not daily as they did in the Old Testament to offer himself. But one time, one time he offered himself as a sacrifice for the world. I won't tell you how that went. Uh, the, the high priest would go in. He would take off his outer robe. It had bells and pomegranates on the bottom. And then he would only have on the inner robe, which was a white linen garment. He would take off that outer robe. When he would offer sacrifice, he would put the outer robe back on. And the people outside could hear the bells and the pomegranates. They knew atonement had been made. But it was every year. They'd go in, they'd go out. They'd see him walk in, they'd see him come out. Here's what Jesus did. And see, keep this in mind too. That when, the, when you look at the tabernacle and you look at all of this that took place in the Old Testament, one thing that is glaringly obvious is there were no chairs in the tabernacle. There were no chairs. There were no seats. Why were there no chairs? Because the work was never done. The work was ongoing. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews that when Jesus went before the Father, he went into the presence of God, and instead of like the high priest, he had to come back out. He went in and sat down. When you sit down, that means your work is done. He, so he goes into heaven, and not only does he sit down, but the Bible says that when he dies and he cries out to the Father, this curtain that blocked access for everybody other than the high priest, this curtain was ripped from top to bottom. In other words, when Jesus died, he opened access for whosoever will now can come into the presence of God. That means, saints of God, as I said earlier, you don't have to wait for another earthly high priest. Catholic brothers, you got to get this. There's no earthly priesthood. 
We've got a great high priest now in heaven who passed into the heavens. And when he got there, he gave God the righteousness and he sat down. He said, it's finished. Everything you need, I've accomplished it. I've paid for it. And all you've got to do now is rest in what I've already done. The world is waiting on another to come. Israel is still waiting on her Messiah. He's already come. He's already come. And then Paul says, he said, hold fast to your profession. I promise you I'm about to quit. We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He was God, and he was man. This is beautiful because a mediator stood between God and man. The thing about Aaron is the fact that Aaron died. Another high priest came, he died. Another high priest came, he died. So the covenant was based on God who could always keep his end, but man, we couldn't because we're sinful. So here's what God did. God became man. So now as man, he could represent us. And as God, he could represent himself. So now we base our salvation on a covenant. Hebrews 7.25 says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So he cannot die. So what he purchased and what he did, it lives on forever. Man, that's something right there. When you stand in salvation, when you, when you understand the salvation experience, it gives you something to have peace about. You know, we shout and we rejoice, we, sh we praise God, and, and those things, sometimes they come and go. Some, every service won't be the same. Some services, we're loud and we're just, we're shouting and we're running. Like my brother Friday night. Y'all should have been there. Every five minutes, my brother got up and took a lap. He just ran. I, I don't know like he knows what God did for him. <laughs> but every service is not the same. You know, some services, we come here and we just weep. And we just weep. We don't even know. You ever been in church, you're crying, and you don't even know why you're crying? <laughs> Young people, you know, my daughter you would tell me all the time, she said, Dad, I don't know why I'm crying. I'm just crying. I said, baby, it's the presence of God. It's just the presence of God. But the thing about salvation, though, is that the reality is there are days you're going to wake up and you don't feel your best. Some days you're going to wake up mad. Some days you're going to wake up and you just, you know, you're, you're, your, your, your husband is just frustrating you. Don't say amen. Your wife is frustrating you. Go ahead and say amen, brothers. Dog, y'all scared. Y'all some good women. Y'all got them trained. <laughs> Nobody said amen. And I got any brother that's going to go with me. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll. Wow, faith worship center. This is the place it is. Well, the women got the men in subjection now. No, I'm just kidding. But your kids make you mad. Okay. All right. There you go. Kids, this is your one shot. Your parents make you mad. Thank you, TJ. I, I, I've been looking for you. It's just, it's just going to be all kinds of stuff that happens. But here's the thing. If you base salvation on how you feel, Tomorrow you may not feel, you're not going to be waking up just speaking in tongues and weeping every day. Salvation is about what you know. And far too often in church we've based salvation on emotional feelings. Hence, you know, especially, you know, I've told you guys my story. I grew up in a very emotional environment. You hit the organ and man, 10 people running. If you, if you ever been in the, the Pentecostal church, Church of God in Christ, the black church, man, you listen, we, we go in, we go crazy. I don't know any way to say it. We call it bucking. The music don't have to be playing. We just throw what we call Holy Ghost fits. You're just stomping and shouting and running and screaming. And, 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 and I saw this as a child. And don't get me wrong. I love my childhood. And it was the presence of God. But a lot of times, if you're not careful, it can be emotions. 
because you can get through with all of that shouting and walk right out of this church and keep gossiping. And just keep walk right out of a prayer meeting shouting and dancing and prophesying and go right back into a home where, where you're keeping up hell or, or right back into an adulterous relationship or walk right back into fornication or walk right back. Salvation is not based on a dance. It's not based on a shout. It's based on a work that was accomplished 2,000 years ago. And this is a daily thing. You have to look to what he did and respond to the person of the Spirit because we have things thrown at us every day. Victory is what I want. Victory is what I need. And victory is not in me dancing. I dance because I realize I got the victory. I'm not dancing to get it. I'm dancing because I know he paid for it. And I'm going to shout. Even if I don't see the manifestation in my life, I'm going to still praise him. Praise is not based on how you feel. It's based on what you know. How I treat my neighbor is not based on how I feel. That hits all of us, doesn't it? It's based on what I know. And what I know, the Bible tells me, is that I am a child of God and I should live this life based on who he is and what he's done for me. He said, we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but he was tempted like us. Jesus is just like us. In that he was tempted. But he's not like us at all in the fact that he's never sinned. And so when you think about his life, it's unique his temptation because he didn't have a sin nature the way we did. And so when you think about us in our lifetime, you were faced with temptation and somewhere along the journey you gave into the temptation and you failed. You sinned. I don't care who you are, how you know, long you've been saved. Let's go ahead and admit it. Amen, somebody. Brothers, you can say amen now. But Jesus was tempted to the maximum test. It was, he was pushed to the furthest that anybody could ever even be tempted. And still he never gave in. And he didn't do that necessarily for himself. He did it for us because we needed perfect representation before God. We needed someone to go before us because we were already messed up and we couldn't pay the debt for ourselves. So we needed someone to do it for us. So Jesus was tempted, yet he did not sin. And out of all of that, that was my introduction. Verse 16, he said, let us therefore. The word therefore old pastor I know used to say the word therefore means that's what it's there for. Therefore, in light of all of this, he says, come boldly unto the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy. Mercy is you didn't get what you deserved. TJ, have your dad ever told you he was going to get you and he didn't get you? Anybody ever had that happen? Never, oh, dog, brother Troy, you, you batting a hundred. I've told my TJ many times, when I get home, and when I got home, there was something, you know, something came up. I remember my oldest son one time, he was, he was little, man. He was just doing all kind of crazy stuff. And I told his mother, you tell him, when I get there, it's on. We going in. And I was coming down those stairs, and he was about six years old. And by the time I could get over there to him, he had this sad look on his face. And he just, out of desperation, I guess he said, I'm going to just try this now. He said, Dad, I love you. Now, how you going to whoop a kid once they... <laughs> you know, we... Was, I'm tough, man. I'm real tough. But I, I mean, that melted me, man. In other words, he didn't get what he deserved. I had mercy on him. Mercy is when it is in one's power to punish, but they don't punish. It's within God's right and his power to punish humanity. But instead of him punishing us, he punished his son. 
Man, so that you and I could receive the benefits of what his son did for us. God said, listen, I'm not going to give you what you deserve, but I'm going to give you something that you don't deserve, which is grace. I didn't get punishment. I didn't get eternal damnation. God gave me his goodness. He gave me his goodness even when I didn't deserve it. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. He said, you got to have mercy first. And then he says that you will find grace in the time of need. I don't know about you, but I need grace every single day of my life. And grace is not just salvation. Grace is the Holy Spirit working in my life every single day. The Bible says that the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men teaching us. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Grace is the effectual working of the Spirit in the life of the believer. Now that you're saved, God says, you don't just need grace to get in, but you need grace to stay in. You need the goodness of God every single day of your life for the change that needs to be affected in your life. In order for me to, uh, you know, get over the aggravations of life. To entreat my wife the right way, to entreat my husband the right way, to entreat my children the right way, to entreat my parents the right way. I need grace. And the Bible tells me and you that we can have grace and mercy. Would you stand to your feet all over the house of God in the time of need? There are so many moments in our lives where we need mercy and we need grace. And we can always find it because of who Christ is and what he's done. Singers and musicians, you can come tonight. Brother, I'm going to ask you now to go ahead and sing. He's worthy of it all again. Oh, man. That's all right. Go ahead and get it out of your system and let's, let's get back in it. He's worthy of it all. And because of who he is and because of what he did... You and I can come before the throne of God daily. The problem with a lot of times with believers is we don't take advantage of what we have. We don't take advantage of what God has given us. It's like giving a, you know, you're, you're, I don't know if any of you parents have kids that work. And your kids, they don't like to spend their own money. Thank you, brother. I had to find a little girl because I, I got a daughter. Just, Daddy cash out me $20. Tomorrow you got plenty of money in your account. But I want something to eat. You work though. They have access to it, but they don't take advantage of it. You have access to everything that the Father has because of what the Son did. And the Holy Spirit makes it real in your life. What I want to encourage you tonight to do, I'll turn it over to Pastor Steve, is take advantage of what Christ did every single day of your life. You don't have to walk around defeated. You don't have to walk around bound mentally with a negative attitude, doubt and unbelief. God's never going to change this. This is never going to change. Man, I wish this. You don't have to walk around with that mindset, but you can walk around with a mindset of faith. I know there are things in your family with your children. We see as parents, man, that breaks our heart. Look beyond what you see and hold to the promises of God. If God promised you that person is going to turn their life around, they're going to come home, hold to that. Hold to what God said. Don't hold to what you see, but hold to what God has already said. Amen. Would you come tonight? If you have a need, if you've got anything you need from the Lord, would you come?
Amen. What a powerful thing to be able to have access to the very God that created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Amen. If our ushers would come, we're going to take up tonight's offering that will go right to Brother Torrance. And uh, I didn't, uh, was, wasn't trying to be overlook anything, but I do want to say that we're, we're honored to have Brother Torrance to come our way tonight. He's been a good friend of ours. And we love him. We got down there Friday night and seen him, and and uh, we we just uh, we found out he wasn't going to be preaching down there tonight, and so so here we go. And uh, and we've been blessed, amen? amen. So I ask you to bless him in return, and this is the way he provides for his family. So give to the man of God tonight, Father. We love you, and we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to give to your work to bless this man. Lord, we only ask what you have already promised us, and that is that you would bless the gift and bless the giver in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, King Jesus, I know you hear me when I pray. Well, King Jesus. I know you hear me when I pray. Oh, when I'm down here in trouble, you send an angel by my way. Well, now Paul and Silas was in prison. It was about that midnight hour where they be. Can I call on Jesus? The jail shook with great power. King Jesus, I know you hear me when I pray. I know I don't believe. Well, I was down here in prison, Lord. You sent an angel by my Oh, I'm looking for that city door now. I just can't stop it. King Jesus, I know you'll help me when I pray. Oh, when I fall through that valley. Give me 
silver Well, some say give me gold Well, but I say give me Jesus Cause he's the rock of my soul King Jesus well, I know you hear me when I pray I know, I know you hear me, Lord Well, I was down here in trouble You sent an angel by my Now some say give me silver, well some say give me gold, well but I say give me Jesus, he's the rock of my soul, King Jesus. Well I know you hear me when I pray, well I will. Give me silver, well, some say give me gold, well, but I say give me Jesus, cause he's the rock of my soul, King Jesus, I know you hear me when I pray, well, I was down here in trouble. Come on, I just want to wash you just a moment. Oh, well, I come through the valley and I beat the mountain top. Well, I'm looking for that city, Lord, now. I just can't stop it. King Jesus. Well, I know you hear me when I pray. Hallelujah. He's the rock of my soul. I know you hear me when I pray. I know you hear me, Lord. Well, I was down here in trouble. But you sent an angel by my way. Well, come on, give him a hand clap of praise and I. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for his presence. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, it's been good to be in the Lord's house with you today, this morning. We had a good service tonight, had a great service uh, this evening, and we just appreciate you coming out and being faithful to the house of the Lord. Real quickly, just let me announce Wednesday night will be uh, our youth service, and so uh, be praying for that service, not just for kids. We need parents, grandparents to come and help us pray for our youth, and uh, so don't forget that. Anything else that we need to announce other than that? All right. Uh, so don't forget Wednesday night. We hope you have a great, great week, and we hope to see you back ready to worship the Lord uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. Amen? Amen? Amen. If you'll bow your